Since I first gave this course the, f uh, the first time, uh, I have written a paper, a very recently published paper called Connecting to the World. And this is really what this course is all about, connecting to the world. Uh, we design uh, buildings and urban environments so that we can connect to them in a visceral way, especially so that uh, those environments influence our health and well-being in the long term in a positive way. That, that's, uh, that's the essence uh, of this course and my message, of course. Uh, uh, much of architecture does not have this as a goal. Uh, I don't agree with that, but uh, what I'm teaching in, in this course uh, is, uh, is uh, how to create healthy uh, environments for the well-being of their users. So why do I need to uh, teach people to connect to the world? Uh, the whole uh, evolution of life forms creates a neurological mechanism for connecting to the world. This is what life is. It's a means of connecting to the world, of getting uh, energy and changing it into information, which is the structural information of the body that enables us to, uh, uh, to, to live and to reproduce. Do I have to teach that to people? Well, unfortunately, yes, because for the past century, our educational system, especially the architectural education and the mass media, have uh, uh, em embarked on a massive um, program of social conditioning that teaches people to disconnect from the world. So we have young children who naturally connect to the world because they are alive. And as soon as they go to school, they go to school and they attend classes in a, a building that looks like a maximum security prison or an interrogation center of the secret police. And they are, their spirit is crushed and they learn, they're taught to disconnect from the world. So that uh, we now have adults, uh, a large part of the world's population, adults that, that uh, have been conditioned to disconnect from the world. So we have to teach them again. Well, how do we do that? It seems like an immense task. It is an immense task. Um, Christoph Alexander, fortunately, has introduced a nice trick. And the trick is to sidestep the issue and, and introduce something, a, a very curious test called the mirror of the self test. And this is how it works. You take two uh, comparable uh, objects, artifacts, uh, pictures of buildings, uh, and you ask yourself, um, which one of these two better is a better mirror of myself, of my inner self? Okay, it sounds vague, but with practices, it's going to become clearer and clearer. So you look at these and you can look at these uh, two uh, images for as long as you want or two objects in front of you. You look at them and eventually you decide that one of them is a better uh, mirror of yourself. OK, now wh what does this do? Uh, first of all, once you get good at it, it will be a wonderful uh, tool for design. But um, let me let me leave that until later. The, the first thing is to is to reawaken those dormant sentiments that we have, the intuitive sentiments of connecting to the world, because you cannot uh, um, perform the mirror of the self test unless you connect with both of these objects. And then you see that you connect to the one on the right uh, more intensely. It's a better mirror of yourself. So the exercise itself teaches you. It's, it's like a Zen exercise or a philosophical exercise or some sort of spiritual exercise, but very practical. So in doing it more and more, you awaken long suppressed feelings inside your own body. And those feelings are, are essential, not only for design. I mean, we're talking about design, but, but eventually for, for living a more wholesome life, for a healthier, psychologically and emotionally healthier life. This is what it is. This is, this is a huge topic uh, that, I'm, that I'm opening here. So uh, if you do this exercise, uh, according to to the uh, uh, to the tips that I give, so so below here uh, 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 there are the um, the relevant uh, chapters that Alexander describes the mirror of the self test. Uh, we have my own recent article on connecting to the world. There's a very nice brief essay by Dave Hora uh, uh, that you should read, and then you practice uh, this uh, mirror of the self test between uh, between uh, two objects. So I guarantee you that after you do this for 50 to 100 times, 
then you're going to have a changed personality. You will start connecting to the world in your every moment. You will start to notice things and you notice which pieces of the environment you can connect to and then make you feel healthier versus which pieces of the environment um, um, you could you do not connect with or that are hostile and, and uh, actually bring you down. Okay, so, so uh, these exercises will help you to connect to the world. Okay, enough of that. Now, what does this have to do with design? It has to do everything with design. It's, it's a, one of many tools in the toolkit that I'm, that I'm introducing in this course. Namely, if you have a design, in order for it to be adaptive, you cannot just bring it out of your head, crumple a piece of paper, throw it on the ground, and, and uh, pay a, uh, a high-profile engineering firm to, uh, to create the uh, working documents, the, the blueprints, and have it built, because it's not going to be adaptive. Okay, It may be shockingly innovative, but it's not going to be adaptive. And adaptive design needs a sequence of decisions based on adaptivity. So this is, this is one possible way of doing that. You have your first major decision. Well, if possible, try to narrow it down to a pair, and you need to choose one of the pairs. Use the mirror of the self. So make something, drawings, a mock-up, uh, something visual, and then uh, use the mirror of the self test to choose between the pair. Okay, so that's one decision. Come up to the next decision as you get into the design. Again, narrow down to a binary decision and you choose one of those two. Uh, or if you have many uh, on the same level, you know, you, you choose a pairwise and then uh, you go on from there. Uh, does it take more time? Well, yes, but look, uh, we're introducing an ethical adaptive design. Uh, so uh, we cannot do that in one step. We need several steps. Uh, so, after a sequence of steps using uh, the mirror of the self test, then you get a final design. It's nothing that you could have uh, come up with all at once, because then you're fooling yourself if you think you can come up with an adapt adaptive design all at once. Uh, it is guaranteed uh, to be more, uh, more adaptive and better for the health of the users. So, this is the, the tremendous uh, uh, utility of the mirror of the self uh, in design. And of course, th this whole course introduces a toolkit. So the mirror of the self-test is one important tool in a toolkit of very different uh, types of tools that will help towards adaptive design. There is a video of Christopher Alexander talking about the mirror of the self, how he came up with it, and it is linked below here. Uh, it's it's uh, from 1995, I believe, and it was recently uh, found and, and posted. So, um, uh, the, the, the point behind uh, this uh, strange um, sounding test is that uh, Alexander wanted to get people to realize which of two options uh, in design had more life and were more uh, uh, sympathetic to human needs and um, would produce uh, a greater state of well-being for a user uh, who would uh, use this design or, or artifact. But of course he was terribly frustrated because he kept asking people for their opinion and there's no agreement. Everyone has a different opinion. So he came up with a trick which is to go around, how to go around one's opinion which is influenced by training, media and prejudices. And the way to do that is through the mirror of the self. So this is really uh, a, a, a strange uh, uh, roundabout way of getting at someone's inner liking, the biological visceral liking, which is shared with the rest of humanity. Okay, whereas opinions uh, are, uh, are formed by uh, external input, and therefore different people are exposed to different input, and they pick up different prejudices, and there can never be a consensus of opinion, whereas there is a consensus of your own visceral uh, reaction to the forms and designs of the environment because uh, the human being is, is a life form that evolved to respond in exactly the same way to, um, to uh, forms and structures and designs in the environment. That's it. So that, that gives you the idea of the, uh, of the origin of the mirror of the self. 
No, my students, uh, my students actually um, uh, uh, <laughs> complained saying that how does the mirror of the self, which is totally subjective or seems totally uh, subjective, fit in with evidence-based design, which is what we are uh, discussing in this course. Uh, the explanation is also a little roundabout, but it's important for those who, who care uh, about this point. Uh, the rest of this course has, has the, the, the viewer or the designer do uh, numerical estimates or, uh, and, and count things, very scientific, in a very simple way though, uh, count things and then add them up or multiply them or use a word count of the word processor and you get numbers and then you can compare uh, two designs or two objects or two buildings uh, using those numbers. Okay, so the introduction of, of uh, quantitative estimates of what used to be called uh, uh, qualitative or aesthetic factors, okay, and not just the thickness of the wall, or the width of the window, or or the uh, or the temperature of a room. <clears throat> no, we're talking about uh, numerical estimates uh, that are then used in order to to create evidence-based design, which is the way uh, it should be. You 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 gather evidence and then you can judge which is a better design or a worse design according to the health of the user. Uh, in the short term and, and in the long term. So this is uh, so data driven. How does that compare with the, with the mirror of the self? Well, I will tell you why. When we do the little experiments that, we, that I'm explaining in the rest of the course, we count say 10 things or five things or 20 things and we add them together, we multiply them. Wouldn't it be better if we got the best possible model? Okay, these are very simple models. Let us try to, to uh, generalize the model, to make it as accurate as possible by adding one million different measurements. And then we can multiply all those together <laughs> or group them in groups and, and do an integration, okay, some fancy mathematical uh, uh, operation in order to get a much more accurate measure. Well, a human being cannot do that. Uh, they cannot handle the data. So what do we need? We need a supercomputer. Okay, <laughs> what is the world's most powerful known supercomputer? It's the human brain. So, so the mirror of the self uses the human brain as a supercomputer in order to gather millions of bits of information that contribute to how a person responds to a design or a form or a, a piece of the built environment. So that's what it is. It is not different from the, uh, the very simple little uh, models that we, are, uh, that we use to measure uh, 10 things and then we add them up. No, it is, it is a generalization. So you see, it is, it is really uh, intimately linked. And Alexander uh, uh, realized that. So, uh, so this is the link uh, with Alexander's uh, work. Now, uh, since Alexander, we have uh, th this uh, um, wonderful ability to use eye tracking. And I introduced eye tracking in this course. And I have this recent article that, that I, not, I note below uh, on eye tracking. So what eye tracking does is to uh, actually measure where the eye fixates uh, for fractions of a second. And all, all you need is just the, the first few uh, fractions of a second or the first a few seconds. And you have a complete picture either with uh, eye tracking soft, uh, eye tracking um, uh, apparatus that you wear uh, uh, on, on a hat or, or, or as glasses. And you actually uh, uh, plot and and um, and, and uh, um, get a track of the uh, of where your eyes fix, and that shows us where there is a, the instinctive interest, and it also shows us where the eye refuses to fix because we just don't want to see in that direction, and that's enough to condemn much of award-winning architecture. The eye refuses to look at such a building because it, re it repels us somehow, or it's just a blank. Either, so either it's neutral, a blank, or it repels, we refuse to look at it. This is a, a, a groundbreaking um, uh, earthquake in the architecture community that uh, most architects and architects and schools are not aware of. But eye tracking uh, has led to those results, and they will cause a revolution in architecture. So, uh, so one way is to actually use the eye tracking um, uh, apparatus that is now very portable. When, when uh, Christopher Alexander was writing uh, uh, The Nature of Order, eye tracking exists. 
existed, but it used to be these very bulky machines and you had to sit in a laboratory and uh, things will, will, you know, you glue something onto your head and then you, you, you know, you look like this, very, very cumbersome. Uh, 30 years later, uh, you just wear a pair of eyeglasses. So there's been a tremendous um, revolution uh, in, the, in the technology for eye tracking so that now we can link eye tracking to the uh, mirror of the self and, and the second revolution that, that took place immediately after the miniaturization of the eye tracking uh, apparatus is the uh, use of software to, uh, to mimic the, the experimental results so that you no longer need the eye tracking uh, uh, apparatus to wear to do it. You can just scan an image and the software gives you with a 85% or 90% accuracy uh, the estimate of of of, of what the soft uh, of what the uh, the actual eye tracking would have given you. So of course this is just a, a, a godsend for uh, for architects and architecture students because you just uh, take an image and and you do the the you you pass it through the software and it gives you the the eye tracking estimate. So this is wonderful. So uh, to link the two, uh, the eye tracking uh, an image will will give you uh, just in a few seconds will give you uh, how a human being will respond to it. And then we'll know if it's going to be attractive or neutral or, or repulsive. Uh, the mirror of the self enables you to do something very similar, but by comparing two different images. And you don't do it in a few seconds. Uh, you have to live with them. You have to stay and look at these for a few minutes because you keep asking yourself the questions, how you connect to both of these images so you know you need time for the uh, for the uh, for the mirror of the self test, and then after a few minutes you get a feeling for the better feeling, and you say, well, you know, this one on this side is the one that I tend to feel more comfortable with. Uh, you know, I connect to it shows me it's a better image of myself. So that is um, uh, it's a different time scale, yet all the results are, are uh, consistent as I show in my paper here, and of course it, it, this is not the end. This is not the last word on the topic. These are the first words on the topic. This has opened up a, a tremendously uh, innovative and useful uh, uh, piece of inquiry for, for, for architects uh, that, will, that will reveal um, what, uh, uh, what um, uh, really attracts us uh, in, in a visceral way. What attracts our body in a visceral way, which is what, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the common self uh, shared by all human beings. So that if uh, if uh, I, I design something uh, that uh, I, uh, I I I run these uh, tests and I run the eye tracking and it gives me an indication that it's going to be very positive, then I can be fairly sure to a certain percentage uh, of of expectation that any user from any social background, from any economical background, from any uh, any any culture of the world, any age will experience this um, uh, environment as positive and healing. So, so here is the predictive quality that has been missing uh, from architecture for, for a long time, you know, awfully long time. Um, we have had uh, uh, only uh, a post-occupancy evaluation, but that's after the building is built, okay? If your post-occupancy evaluation finds out that the building is terrible, what do you do? You're going to tear it down. You're going to make uh, extremely costly uh, uh, changes to the building. Nobody affords that. Nobody cares. That's why uh, even post-occupancy evaluation is, is not done nowadays. Uh, because, you know, if you find something wrong, what do you do? Nobody has money to fix it. Okay, so, so uh, with this, uh, uh, we, we conclude the extremely useful topic uh, of eye tracking and then introduce and, and glue to it uh, on the side, uh, the, the, the new revolution that has occurred uh, that joins the, the mirror of the self test uh, with, uh, with the eye tracking, especially the, the ease of uh, software evaluation.